Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. Just before we began this, uh, I told Nick Confessori that he's a better, better man than I am because I don't think I could have subjected myself to that many hours of watching Tucker Carlson. Uh, so um, thanks for doing that, Nick. Thanks for taking one for the team here. It's a service to readers, a service to our audience, to, <laughs> to work with my colleagues, to listen to four plus years of Tucker Carlson and really try to understand what the show is about. Okay, so uh, for uh, for our listeners, uh, Nick is a political and investigative reporter for the New York Times, staff writer at the New York Times Magazine, and a political analyst for MSNBC. And he was part of the team that won the 2009 Pulitzer Prize for its coverage of the downfall of Governor New York Governor Elliot Spitzer. And he wrote, uh, if you have not read it, you really ought to, uh, that three-part series on Tucker Carlson and his show for The Times, which is probably the deepest dive into the the mind and the culture of of Tuckerism that's that's been written. So I, I, let's start with kind of the basics, Nick. Um, you know, Tucker Carlson's been around for a while. It's not like he has not been covered. Why did you make the decision to, you know, spend so much time, devote so many resources to one show on one cable channel? It's a great question and one I'm happy to answer. I think that Tucker Carlson is extraordinarily influential, not just within the world of, of viewers of Fox, which is large for cable, small by other standards, but he's also influential on the tone and future of conservative politics in this country. And I think that it's really hard to understand kind of where we ended up in this country, in our politics, if you don't fully understand the trajectory mm -hmm. of somebody like Tucker Carlson, who is a smart, conservative, talented guy who moved from one pole of the right to a very different one in a lot of ways over the course of his career, whose beliefs changed and whose changing beliefs also reflect a radically changed context in American politics between Reagan and Trump. And he's unusually effective. I mean, this is the the point that I think you make and, and you document. The fact is that, you know, we, we can talk about, you know, how deplorable he is, but the fact is that he knows what he is doing and he he makes a big difference. I mean, he really has turned himself into the id of Trumpism, hasn't he? You can call him the id. You can call him the high priest. Um, I think in some ways he's more Trump than Trump. I think he's a better exponent of some consistent underlying ideology than the former president himself is, uh, who is a politician and, is all, and, and all politicians equivocate and move around and flip flop. Um, uh, and yeah, he, he, he's the high priest, he is the id, and he's an influence. He is bringing ideas to the forefront. He is taking one strand that has always um, been in our politics, uh, usually on some version of the right, sometimes on some version of the left. And he has made it the beating heart of the top rated show on cable news. I want to stick with this point because you suggest that in some respects, Carlson has taken Trumpism away from Trump and that in some ways he's now become the enforcer on the right. And in, even including when Trump might deviate from what Carlson thinks is the proper line. I think that's right. And that's been true. That's been true for a couple of years. I think that Carlson is more consistent in his criticism of American adventurism or overseas entanglement uh, than Trump is. Trump would go all over the place. He would advocate for for war and regime change on one day, um, and and advocate America first on a different day. You know, Trump is more emotional and more prone to being stroked by foreign leaders uh, mm -hmm. and influenced by them. Carlson is more consistent in his way. But even more recently, Charlie, think about the vaccines. Uh, the, yeah. the former president has has been in different places on the vaccines. He both understands that a part of his audience is anti-vax and also wants credit, right? He wants credit for, for developing the vaccine, for his government's work on the vaccine, which, by the way, he deserves. Uh, and so when, when Trump pivoted last year and said, hey, you know what? It's important to get vaccinated. He pivoted because he had a role in getting the vaccine out. He wants some credit for it. He's a politician. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Carlson has not pivoted. Uh, Carlson has continued to make claims like that 
the vaccination program is a Nazi experiment and to elevate distorted information about its risks and what federal authorities know about it and to platform people on his show who are basically conspiracy theorists about the vaccine. Because that's where, probably where the audience is, I think. It's where the ratings are. But in that sense, I think he is speaking more truly to that faction on the right and in the MAGA universe. One of the more extraordinary episodes was when, um, after Ted Cruz had a lapse and called January 6th the violent terrorist attack, uh, Cruz was forced to apologize. He didn't apologize to Trump. <laughs> he had to apologize to Tucker Carlson. And it's that's a, right. It is I, an amazing I, 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 videotape. Uh, it is. It's it's painful to watch. Um, partly painful because I think Senator Cruz was right for the first time. No, and I think he was. I mean, I mean, I know he was right. I don't think it. It's a fact. And he was also correct in trying to draw a distinction between the people who were on the ellipse at a lawful protest and the and the people, the smaller group that some time later marched to the Capitol uh, and committed violence and tried to stop an election. Um, and, and Senator Cruz is right to make that distinction. Mm -hmm. Tucker Carlson and a lot of people like him want you to not make that distinction. And what they want, judging from the way they talk about it on his show, is to imagine that people being prosecuted are being prosecuted for innocently protesting a legitimate gripe about the uh, the content of the elections. Um, he wants to take your focus away, I think, from the fact that the people who went into the Capitol were wrong. They committed crimes. And what they were doing uh, was not responsible or reasonable protest. They were there to wreak havoc, commit violence, and conduct an extra constitutional operation against the country. And one of the things that he does that is extremely, and I will say, you know, skillful in, in, in quotes, though, is the way that he has weaponized, um, you know, the issue of crime and of urban violence, but also uh, the protest from last year. And he's able to push the line that the rest of the media is not telling you this story and saying, well, they were willing to accept this and all the pictures of burning Kenosha versus this. And in some ways, he is able to exploit maybe the you know, the uh, imbalance in the coverage of some of those things? What is your take on that? You know, the truth is, Charlie, that the media, right, is such a vast and diverse ecosystem now um, that if you're going to talk at 10,000 feet, you can find the media guilty of almost anything. <laughs> right. You can attribute and, and almost any statement right. to the media. Right. And that's honestly, that's a, that's a common practice in politics. Um, it's a common rhetorical device. I get it. You know, I think it's obvious that mainstream journalism covered the full spectrum of what was happening during and around these protests. They were mostly peaceful. There was violence and property destruction in other circumstances. I think all of it has been written about. The question you have to ask yourself is, what stands in for the whole, right? Does, do the instances of, of violence and, and property destruction and arson become the entirety of Black Lives Matters, as it mm -hmm. does on Tucker Carlson's show? Mm -hmm. Or is that one strand of the events that were happening, and maybe not the one that stands for what most people in most cities and towns around the country were out there to do? Black Lives Matter began, and by the way, when it started, it had pretty bipartisan support around the country. And you have to ask yourself how and why that changed. Was it because mm -hmm. of what protesters did or how it was covered in some parts of the media? But the reality is that what got people out to protest was a time and time again, a person, often a black person, ends up dead mm -hmm. for a traffic stop or for shoplifting or for some other reason, and they did not deserve to die, and something is obviously wrong. That's all that Black Lives Matter really is at its heart, I think. And if you watch the show, it's something very different. Very different. There's so much to talk about here, including the pro-Putin propaganda that uh, the Tucker Carlson traffics in that has become, you know, a big deal for Russian state TV. We could talk about his election denialism and the fact that, you know, he has pushed the big lie. We could talk more about uh, his, you know, vaccine skepticism and the kind of people he has on. But the most extraordinary thing, and feel free to disagree with me here, but the most extraordinary thing about your piece, Nick, was how blunt your assessment of his show when you said, 
that Carlson has constructed what may be the most racist show in the history of cable news and by some measures, the most successful. You use the word racist. Talk to me about that, because, I mean, that was that was when you and the, and the Times basically said, we're just going to say it. We're, we're not going to dance around this. We are going to use, we're going to say that Tucker Carlson is a racist and his show is racist. I mean, that was the whoa moment for your story. I think that in any story, uh, the findings should flow from the facts and the facts should flow from the reporting that you do. I'm not here, I don't work for the Times to write hot takes. I don't write opinion pieces. Uh, this is not an opinion and it's not a take. It's a fact. And I'll take you what's behind the fact. Mm -hmm. Because I know that there are some listeners of, of this podcast and other shows um, who will say, that's what the Times talking. Mm -hmm. And the Times thinks everything is racist. Well, I don't. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm not in the habit of calling everything I don't like racist as a writer or as a reporter. What's behind that? Obviously, Tucker Carlson does not use racial slurs on the air. And if you watch his show, you'll see him say, I believe in what Martin Luther King believes. I believe in judging mm -hmm. people by the content of their character. But what does the show teach and show? It teaches fear and loathing every single night. He tells you that protesters who would like the police to stop killing black people are trying to destroy America. That refugees from Afghanistan, people who helped our soldiers during the war, are coming here to destroy America. That immigration of all kinds is what is truly hurting American workers, the main reason uh, that American workers are struggling and falling behind. And furthermore, that it's all part of a grand conspiracy. Uh, that's what the show teaches and what it's about. And when you look at the actual themes of the show in a factual way, what you see is that since he got the 8 p.m. slot at Fox, replacing Bill O'Reilly, he has devoted more and more of his show to a set of conspiracy theories that he's borrowed from the far right, from the racist right, and, and made his own. The most important one is replacement theory. And you've probably heard about that. Yeah. You probably saw the uproar mm -hmm. last April when he said, well, of course, there is an elite cabal that wants to import people from Latin America and Africa to crush American citizens. First of all, not true. Um, but that wasn't the first time, not by a long shot. He has repeated versions of that on more than 400 episodes of the show. That thing, replacement theory comes from the bowels of the racist fringe in America, from white nationalists and anti-Semites who have been developing that idea for decades. That's where it comes from. And don't, you know, if you don't trust me, ask the white nationalists and they will tell you the exact same thing. Tucker is taking our ideas and we are psyched about it. Now, he knows that and he knew that it would generate the blowback. So I'm trying to think how to phrase this, but it worked for him. His audience, he's giving his audience what they like. And the Murdochs, who were called out on it by groups like the, the Anti-Defamation League, decided to stand by him. So talk to me about that, because I mean, I agree with you. And I thought it was breathtaking that you would take something that was really confined to the far edges of the white nationalist fever swamps. And there it is on primetime Fox. And he he not only didn't back away from it. I mean, as you point out, he has really accelerated all of that. So what is the thinking behind Fox in going, yeah, you go, Tucker, you you go with something that is objectively racist rhetoric? Carlson's show is the profit center of the profit center of the Murdoch empire uh, in the U.S. Um, you know, since they sold the, the, the kind of movie and television assets uh, in their 2018 deal, um, Fox is is the heart of the Fox Corporation. Fox News is the heart of the Fox Corporation. Um, and according to our reporting, uh, we used estimates uh, from a company called iSpot. Despite all the boycotts and the controversy, or perhaps because of the boycotts and the controversy, and we'll talk about that, Tucker Carlson tonight has brought in more annual advertising revenue since 2018 than any other show. So why is that? <laughs> yeah, why is it? Yeah, okay, because I've read about all of the boycotts. I've read about all the people who said we're not going to advertise anymore. And you're saying that not only is his audience up, but the revenue is up as well. How does that work? I think he has found the buttons to push. He has found the source material to light up the audience. And I'll put it to you the way a former Fox colleague of Carlson's put it. What makes people 
tune in to Fox and keep watching it. Anger. But what's better than anger? Fear. And that is the big difference, I think, between the Bill O'Reilly show and the Tucker Carlson show. Bill O'Reilly's show was, these people are screwing you. You should be angry about it. Carlson's show is, these people are trying to destroy you and your children and everything you love. And they know they're doing it and they hate you. I'm not, this is not hyperbole, Charlie. These are the kinds of things he says on the show. They hate you. They want to destroy you. Also, they're stupid and incompetent. Um, but also, they hate you and want to destroy you. And I think that that has been extremely, extremely powerful as television. And you have to add to the fact that Tucker Carlson is a really good television host. He's very good at his job. I want to emphasize how powerful this is. And as you wrote, Carlson's on-air technique, gleefully courting blowback, then fashioning himself as his aggrieved viewer's partner in victimhood has helped position him as much as anyone to inherit the populist movement that grew up around uh, Trump. So um, he plays this this very, very, I, I think he knows exactly what he is doing, that it's like, okay, I'm a victim, but the real story here is they hate you. You are the victims. And in, in, his, in his sort of lizard brain, Trump does that as well. But the convincing people that they are under siege, that, that mm -hmm. your opponents don't just disagree with you, they want to destroy you, that is really at the heart of a lot of this, isn't it? It is, and it's the playbook. It's a carefully developed playbook that they've developed with ratings data, and they know that it works, which is why they play it all the time. And once you understand this, you'll never stop seeing it, Charlie. You'll never stop seeing right. it on Fox. You also never stop seeing it on Twitter. It's the playbook for half of the conservative Twitter personalities, the MAGA type Twitter personalities out there. Attack and then play victim. Attack yeah. and then play victim over and over. And uh, what they found at Fox was that they could take, they could court controversy, which is to say they could say something that they borrowed from a white nationalist website. And then people on the left in the middle would say, oh my God, you, that, that came from Stormfront. And right. then Carlson comes back the next night with more content. And he says, why are they trying to stop me from telling you the mm -hmm. truth? Mm -hmm. What are they trying to hide? Well, they can't stop me. And I work for Fox, and Fox stands behind me. So what happens in that transaction? You, the viewer, feel loyalty to Fox for backing up Tucker. Mm -hmm. And you feel connected to Tucker's victimhood because, as he will explain, that they're also trying to shut you up. You can't just say what you want anymore. You can't speak the truth anymore. And they're wrong, and they know it. So all they can do is stop you from talking. They run that playbook all the time. Well, and as as you point out, I mean, he's you know constantly telling his his viewers they're living under siege from you know the the, the protesters, um, diseased migrants from south of the border, refugees importing alien cultures, and by tech companies and cultural elites who will silence them or label them racist if they complain. Okay, so you saw, I'm sure, the tweet that he put out where um, you have the front page of the New York Times, your article, which labels him and documents the way in which he is a racist. And he's holding it with the biggest shit eating grin on his face. Like, isn't this great? Isn't this sort of yeah. part of it? Is that, I mean, I look, I, I guess maybe I, I am old enough to remember when being called a racist was something that was, was upsetting. It, it had stigma to it. And I looked at that picture and I thought, boy, there is the illustration of the way in which that stigma has been wiped away. And he revels in it. He was reveling in being exposed as a racist, or at least that's the way it looked. Well, I think you were right in your column, which I did read, Charlie, okay. Okay. Uh, that the currency of what's racism has become a little diluted um, in American life. Um, you can look at it two ways. You could say that we should reserve that word for only things that are truly racist, and those things should be terribly opposed. We could also say that racism is a force that operates in ways that are obvious and not obvious, and prejudice does live within all of us, including me. And let's lower the stakes around accusations of racism or lower the stakes around a discussion of, of how racism works in our society so that we can actually talk about it and fix it. And I think what we have now in, in our culture is a little bit of the worst of both worlds. We have very high stakes because in our common culture, 
being called a racist is the worst thing you can be called in some mm -hmm. ways, in some parts of the country, in some milieus. And on the other hand, we're identifying more and more things as racist. And some of that, I think, is is healthy, right? It's important to understand mm -hmm. how the black-white wealth gap is rooted in something like redlining, an actual racist policy that was in place for a very long time that made it really hard for black families to build wealth in this country while everybody else, including my ancestors, were building wealth. So I think we have to have those discussions, but you're right that it is very easy in our spread out and fragmented and no gatekeepers media ecosystem these days, you can always find some outrage monger who will call you know, white bread racist. And even if that person has five Twitter followers, someone on Carlson's side of thing can say, you see, that's what they all think. Yeah. And, yeah. Th and there are no rules for that. And that's just the way it is, unfortunately. No, I mean, we're at the point now where if, uh, if, a, if a commentator or a politician is accused of being racist, the first thing they do is put out a fundraising letter saying, see what they're doing, they're calling me this, um, rally around. All right, here's, the, here's, I think, one of the questions that, that haunts me about all this. You said before, I think quite accurately, that uh, Tucker Carlson has found this button to push of fear and anger. So the question is, when he pressed the button, does the button expose something that was there or does he create it? Were people preloaded? Were the American people sitting out there with these fears and these grievances? And obviously some of that is a pre-existing condition. So to what extent was he exploiting something that was there as opposed to that he is fomenting it, that he is, you know, that voice in their heads telling them something that might not have been at the forefront of politics. You understand what I mean? Getting at it's like what was there and what does he create? It's a subtle thing, and it's a hard thing to document and report. So we kind of move into the realm of, of speculation. But I think right. it's a really interesting question. Certainly, as a as a writer, <laughs> um, I want to believe in the the power of words to affect how people think, and the power of words to change people's uh, view of the world. And I also think that the power of leadership in its different forms, really matters. Who steps out and gets the room going? Who provides the explanation that makes things click for people? That comes in different forms, right? And I think it's, it's probable that the Carlson is one, is one version of that. You know, I think most people in this country probably support legal immigration, mm -hmm. and they don't like the idea of people coming here without permission. People are also human and generous, and they understand that, like, not everybody who comes across the border without permission is some kind of an invader. And maybe some of them do, you know, should stay here. I should get asylum. These are complex things. And I think people have complex opinions on immigration and their opinions change. And you can ask any reporter who's done man in the street interviews on the campaign trail about how consistent people are <laughs> in the way they stack up their yeah. viewpoints on stuff. And, yeah. and they aren't consistent and they're actually, no, they're not. yeah, and they're interesting. Yeah. People are very interesting. And so, and I say all that as background to say that I think Carlson said that we think he's racist because because he believes in borders. We we didn't write that. We didn't say no. it. I don't believe it. No. no. <laughs> Every country has borders, pretty much. I think. And what we're calling racist here is the importation of obviously and self declared racist ideas oh, yeah. um, oh, onto sure. the show, right? Sure. Uh, but I think he is he has taken a viewpoint, or he has taken uh, an audience that is uncomfortable with immigration, that feel discomfort. He talks about it on the show. There are some people in my neighborhood who I don't know, who don't look like me, who don't speak my, my language. I have some sense that, that there's a lot of them in the ER getting health care. I may have read some websites that says they're getting all, you know, you know, kind of all getting free Obama phones. And he gives them a theory of the case. And like with all conspiracy theories, it has power. His theory sure. of the case is this problem exists because the people in power want it to exist. Mm -hmm. Now, and they have a plan. Their plan is to replace you because they hate you. That's, that's, and that's over a, that's a and powerful, over and, over. and he says yeah. it over and over, Charlie, over and over every night. Sometimes the very same sentences, very same words. Now, if you went out and said, well, immigration is a complex problem, and actually Obama uh, had a pretty tough border policy, so much so that immigration activists um, hated his policy 
And Biden uh, has a mix of policies uh, that have also not satisfied the immigration doves in his in his party and even in his own administration, people who have left. Um, uh, you can say that immigration is a hard problem to solve. Legal immigration is a hard problem to solve. But that won't get you ratings. <laughs> what gets you ratings is this problem exists because the people in power wanted to and they hate you. Yeah. And it's your problems can be blamed on those people. Well, you point out that Carlson, you know, does stand in this long nativist tradition. It runs deep in American history. You know, Father Cog Coughlin, you know, from the 1930s, Pat Buchanan, um, none of whom had the kind of influence. But also there are other traditions as well. So I'm sitting here in Wisconsin, know a lot of conservatives in w Wisconsin. And five or six years ago, the dominant re Republican around here was Paul Ryan, who had a very, very different vision of, of where the Republican Party should go, the kind of appeals that it would go. Ryan's Priebus is from uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin, who uh, you know presided over the autopsy after 2012, saying that the Republican Party needed to change its stance toward uh, uh, you know Hispanic Americans uh, and African Americans and to be more in inclusive. And if you would have talked to Republicans back then, I mean, there was this sense that uh, the, the party needed to move in that direction. You talk to some of those same people now, and it, it does feel like invasion of the body snatchers. And I mean, I'm yeah. mentioning Paul Ryan as, a, as an alternative tradition. It strikes me as just one of those strange ironies of time that Paul Ryan, who is sort of the anti-Trump uh, in many ways, is on the board of Fox News That's right. and has remained silent while that network has embraced the most sort of vicious racism. I mean, you, you know, what, what do you think is going on there? I mean, you know, his entire well, he's he's a young man. publicly silent. <laughs> well, okay. uh, which is which is no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not passing judgment here either yeah. way. Um, I would love to know what, if anything, he's saying behind closed doors. But you're right; he has not come out publicly. He has not quit the board. Um, uh, look, part of this is how power works. Think of all of the people who are Republicans you knew who had more conventional conservative politics, uh, Reagan-esque politics. Um, who after four years of Trump are, are suddenly America firsters because that's where the energy is. That's where the money is. That's where the power is. That's yeah, how politics that's works. Um, and people, people move towards power and they adjust themselves and their own ideas towards power. Okay, so I want to switch gears a little bit to talk about, you know, Fox as a whole and that this ecosystem that, that you describe, I think, quite accurately. But let's do that right after this. Let me tell you a story from last week. The folks from Eden Pure sent me some samples of their thunderstorm air cleaning ozone system. I had to say that I wasn't sure how this was going to work because they're very light and compact and somewhat small. And my wife was a little bit skeptical. I have to tell you, I was blown away by this product. The proven oxy technology destroys viruses, odors, mold, and more. It cleans the air of all allergy-causing particles so you can breathe easy again. I put one in a downstairs bathroom and the other in our bedroom. And I have to tell you, it has completely changed the environment of the entire house. There is that sense of ozone. I said to my wife the other day, I said, just come upstairs. I want to show you something. We start walking up the stairs and I said, you notice that? She goes, wow. I wasn't expecting that because it feels like all of the windows were open and you could feel the sea breeze coming into the house. I cannot believe how effective this is. It freshens your house, gets rid of the odors like litter boxes, trash cans, cigarette smoke, diapers, cooking smell, and more. And there have been more than 200,000 of these thunderstorms sold, so you know it works. But you are going to be really surprised about how it just changes the entire environment of your house. It's not just that you never breathe dirty air again or you don't have filters to buy. It doesn't take up any floor space. It just plugs directly into the wall. It's nearly completely silent. So it is great for use in bedrooms. And it comes with a six-foot USB cord. You can take it with you to travel for clean, fresh air in hotel rooms. And it's not in the same category as other air freshers. Take my word for that. So go to EdenPureDeals.com, discount code CHARLIE3, the number three, to save $200. That's three Thunderstorm air purifiers for under $200. And the shipping is free. Okay, we are back with Nick Confessori, political and investigative reporter for the New York Times. 
who wrote a recent three-part series on Tucker Carlson and his show for The Times, you point out that, that Fox News right now is trying to wring more of a return out of a slowly declining audience, which is interesting because they become more influential. But in fact, the audience is kind of shrinking and dying off. The, they're, uh, the older white conservatives who make up Trump's base and much of Fox core viewership. So give me some sense of, of how they are doing this, how they are trying to keep viewers loyal, especially in an age in which there are even crazier networks out there, you know, OAN and Newsmax, and there was some anxiety before the election that they might lose some of that. So what is the Fox formula at the moment? Well, look, one thing that's important to keep in mind is that Fox is just better at cable TV than anybody else, and they have been mm. for a very long time. They're just better at it. They're a ratings machine. They attract an audience that's so big it's sometimes twice the combined audience of, of MSNBC, where you and I appear from time to time, and CNN combined. They're good at what they do. Um, but as somebody pointed out to me, and, or, or made the comment to me when I was reporting this, um, if Tucker Carlson had discovered that being a Jeb Bush stan would mint ratings and did that, Fox would be fine with that, right? Yeah, sure. It's just that this is what worked. So what's changed? Well, Although I know a lot of uh, people on the left don't believe this, for a long time, Fox under Roger Ailes tried to build a really robust news operation. It didn't report news the same way that maybe the New York Times does every day. But Ailes believed in having a news division. He protected it in the eyes of people who worked there. Even some people who at the time say they didn't realize he was protecting it. <laughs> and then Fox had their opinion programming. What happened during the Trump era after Ailes left and then passed away was that ratings, which are always the most important currency in cable news, anywhere you go, suddenly became the only currency at Fox. Mm. It was the only thing anybody could agree on was important. And over time, the people who ran the daytime shows, the newsier shows, usually on the day side of Fox, outside of primetime, were more and more people with primetime roots and primetime sensibilities. And Suzanne Scott, the, the chief executive of Fox, would say, we have to do more of what we do best. And what does Fox do best? What it does best is opinion programming, conservative opinion programming. Uh, and so Fox day side and the news side uh, began to feel more and more like the opinion side. And the reporters there didn't always like it. Um, and some of them would protest it at the time, like uh, Shepard Smith. Go on. He would tell his viewers in 2018 during the midterms about the caravan, the migrant caravan. No one is coming to get you. But every night in primetime, where the highest ratings were, the hosts were saying, oh, yes, they're coming to get you. And then a second piece of this is, is again, the ratings. In TV, the ratings that are called quarter hour ratings are, are mm -hmm. really common. Everyone has, has access to them, right? That shows you how each 15-minute block of the show would work. If you're higher ranking, you can order up the minute-by-minute -minute data, as they call it, the minute-by-minutes. And you can see the minute-by-minute minute ebb and flow of the audience. You can see what topics and guests make them leave. Now, Fox didn't invent the minute-by-minutes, and they're not the only ones who use them. But my understanding is that Fox institutionalized them across every hour of every day. It became like Moneyball. And in fact, that's exactly how Fox executives pitched it internally. The guy who runs the news parts of Fox, a guy named Tom Lowell, who's a former producer for Megyn Kelly, and a former O'Reilly producer named Ron Mitchell would pitch this to the news side people as money ball for TV. Audience first. What does the audience want? Now, as I said, ratings are always the most important thing in cable news. Everyone uses them. But these guys started to vet every decision, every single booking decision, coverage decision around ratings. So they're looking at that dial, what pe people are basically, you yeah. know, what, what raises. So I'm just reading between the lines. They discovered basically that the brown menace is what people want. That this is why Fox leaned harder into uh, stories of illegal immigrants, non-white Americans committing acts of crime or violence plucked from local news sites. I mean, that's, is that their dopamine hit for those ratings? It is. Uh, it's not the only dopamine hit. During the pandemic, they got good ratings on stories about houses of worship being shut down by health authorities. But immigration is just a live wire. 
what didn't get good ratings are Fox's news reporters, unless they were covering the uh, caravan uh, or covering uh, Brown okay. Menace. And and you mentioned the, the, the term Brown Menace, put it in quotes. That's right. the nickname that people on the news side of Fox started giving to these stories because they were ordered up so relentlessly by news executives. And they'd say, oh, more Brown Menace. That's how Fox people talked about it. And you also point out, you know, how, you know, Carlson is binding viewers of the show. Uh, he's the face and the future of the network and this whole Fox Nation, which is the boycott proof subscriber only version of Fox News, doesn't have any really news in it. And, and that's where, you know, Tucker pushes these, you know, sort of faux documentary like features like his Patriot Purge, the one that was pushing the big lie that was so bad that it caused uh, my good friends uh, Jonah Goldberg and uh, Steve Hayes to actually quit as uh, contributors to Fox News. Okay, I have a really naive question to ask you, mm -hmm. um, and I'm wincing as I'm, as I'm doing this because okay, they, 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 they push the buttons about the brown menace. They have pushed the big lie. They have pushed vaccine hesitancy and conspiracy theories, which probably have caused millions of people not to be vaccinated. Um, he has been a, if not pro-Putin, then at least anti-anti-Putin. At the <laughs> highest reaches of Fox, are there, are there, do they wrestle with their conscience about this or, or is it just about the, the rating? I mean, I mean, it's, at some point you go, okay, we are, we're making lots of money. We have lots of ratings, but you know, guys, we might be tearing the country apart. We might be destroying democracy, killing Americans you know, dividing us by by race, um, supporting the kinds the worst, the worst thugs in the world. You know, maybe this is wrong. <laughs> does, the, does that kind of conversation ever take place? I mean, I understand Shepard Smith leaves, Chris Wallace leaves, but, you know, in the executive suites, do you think they have those moments or not anymore? They sometimes do. And I'll tell you about one that's in the story, believe it or not. In 2018, Tucker Carlson almost out of the blue, or so it would seem, started covering so-called farm murders in South Africa. Now, I remember outside of a major war or border disputes, name a major overseas story that Fox Primetime uh, would normally cover if it doesn't involve immigration, right, or a war. Mm -hmm. um, so people at Fox were like, what is this about? And what's he saying? Well, what, what, what Carlson was doing was, was talking about this, this thorny question in South Africa where... Um, most of the farmland is owned by white people, and some large portion of it was was dispossessed uh, from uh, from African South Africans, right? From Black South Africans, um, uh, and there was a lot of violence in South Africa, a lot, and a lot of violent crime. And there's a lot of it on farms. There are dozens of people every year who were murdered on white-owned farms, often the white people themselves, uh, sometimes their farmhands. And uh, he started covering this. And by the way, so did Murdoch tabloids in Australia, mm. where it became a local a local wedge issue in sort of a classic whipped up tabloid fashion. And Carlson was making major mistakes on the facts about this stuff and kind of lumping it all together in a way that is actually fairly common, once again, on the far right, where they talk about farm murders in South Africa as part of a white genocide, a term that, that Carlson does not use, but which seems to me is, is sort of communicated in the way he talks about this. And so uh, at the highest reaches of Fox, there is a meeting they have every day called the News Group. This is a super secretive, super senior meeting. It's the leaders of all the major business units of Fox, Fox Business Channel, uh, the morning shows, primetime on Fox News. And the highest ranking black executive at the time at Fox News, the head of the Fox Business uh, Network, told his fellow executives that this stuff was wrong, that, that Carlson was getting it wrong, and that he was getting this, this narrative from Stormfront, which is a neo-Nazi site, and they overruled him. Now, Fox disputed our reporting here, too. It won't surprise mm -hmm. you. They said that, that, that the news executive, this guy named Tom Lowell, who overruled uh, the Fox business guy, Brian Jones, was only asking that the story be reported out to see if it was true. Okay. Um, well, you know, it wasn't true. And Carlson kept covering it on the primetime side until he finally got the president of the United States to tweet about land expropriation and farmers in South Africa, a stunning propaganda coup that actual white nationalists and identitarians, mm. as they call themselves, started celebrating. They were like, we finally red-pilled people uh, on white genocide. <laughs> 
and and so so they knew they were told that's where he's getting this stuff and not only is it coming from a noxious source he's getting his facts wrong but it did not matter that and there was no apparent trimming of the sails or change in course certainly on carlson's program your history of Tucker Carlson, I thought, was fascinating. I knew a lot of it, uh, you know, going back to the Daily Caller, um, when he was really considered to be a member of the public intellectual class and conservatives. But also, I mean, you know, some of the personal stuff. I mean, the fact that he was abandoned by his mother, you know, rocky marriage, mother accused of drug abuse, father seeks custody. She doesn't even show up for the hearing. She flees the country. She never saw Tucker and his brother again. I mean, his father, Richard Carlson. You no, know, Mary's an heir to the Swanson, you know, frozen dinner fortune, and she adopted uh, them. I mean, he grew up in tremendous uh, privilege. And he has a long history, you know, writing for, you know, becomes a regular on conservative publications uh, on CNN and C-SPAN. He actually was a host on MSNBC, you know, and trivia. Yes, briefly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so he's, he's, you know, and then, of course, the Daily Caller, which was anti-PC. But as you point out here, um, you know, he always had that, that is, you know, kind of, in you know within his his orbit there were always some anti-immigration types you know one of his deputy editors mingled with members of the wolves of vinland youth for western civilization one of his interns appeared in a photo with a one you know and a white nationalist who turned out to be one of the speakers at the charlottesville rally and you know very early on he was seeing you know immigration as sort of a as a threat to civilization but the Tucker Carlson of pre-2016 is, is in many ways hard to reconcile with what he has become. In many ways, sort of like anyone that knew J.D. Vance pre-2016. And I guess how much of this, and of course we can never know, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot here or play psychiatrist. Mm-hmm. I mean, how, how much of this is genuine uh, conviction on his part and how much of it is uh, is just the pure opportunism seeing that this is where the power of the influence goes and I'm I'm going to go there and how much of it is what he actually believes. Is there any way to sort that out? Uh, I can only make my educated guess based on my reporting. And you're right, it's a little bit unknowable. But we can pick up clues from things he has said about his, his own journey and things he has said about his life and his views. Um, I, don't, I don't think he's an opportunist. I, I think that's the wrong word. Mm-hmm. I do think that if you start with a position of skepticism of immigration and you're learning and imbibing views from colleagues, that make you more and more skeptical than you get on TV, and you find out that turning up the dial on your rhetoric and darkening it gets you more ratings, it becomes really hard to distinguish, like, you know, factually, what do I really believe, quote unquote, really believe, and what am I saying because it gets ratings? I'm not sure it's an answerable question. I do think it all begins with a genuine set of personal convictions. And what I think is kind of funny, Charlie, is, uh, is, is what you said actually about how the pre-2016 Carlson is hard to reconcile. I don't think it's hard to reconcile at all. Hmm, um, okay. I think the I think the pre-2000 Carlson is hard to reconcile. Okay, fair enough. That's where the big where the big shift comes. And one of the things that surprised me in my reporting was really how far back this goes for him. The 9/11 era, the War on Terror era, and the Iraq War were really big turning points in his thinking about politics. I don't expect a person in their late 20s to have the same views 20 years later, and neither would you. So it's not a mark against him necessarily that he changed his views on this, but but the evolution is really striking, you know. And he didn't begin as an ideologue. He, he was a funny writer. He was yeah, he was. He was more of a portraitist, more of an observational writer, sort of like a PG or work type. Mm-hmm. And he really soured on on the quote unquote neocons and the Bush era establishment in Washington because of the Iraq War. And I think you'll often find in politics that people who become anti-foreign invention, who become paleocons uh, on foreign policy, uh, that can be a gateway to increasingly nativist-tinged and openly nativist viewpoints. It's often kind of connected, and the, the scaffolding is already there in the intellectual institutions on the right and in the politics of the right. So that doesn't surprise me, but, but I do find it funny that people in 2018 we're like, well, who is this guy? Why is he so different? I, you know, he was this nice man about town that I knew. And I kind of understand why Carlson would roll his eyes at that because it actually wasn't that new for him. No. Well, <laughs> he had been there for a while. He was partying with Alex Jones at the convention in Cleveland in, in 2016. Um, you know, he was going on Infowars, he was going on Bubba the Love Sponge, he was 
you know, to, to get some, some airtime when he was down and out from cable. So like he was kind of heading there for a while. He, he was heading there, but it, it wasn't maybe quite so overt. No, I mean, I'll tell you my, my last encounter with him, uh, which, which was extremely awkward. I think I mentioned this before on the podcast for about 15 years, I was always the uh, master of ceremonies for the uh, Wisconsin right to life dinner, you know, out, up until 2016. And I wasn't invited to come back in 2016, even though obviously there were some tensions there because of, you know, Trump and, you know, pro-Trump, anti-Trump, et cetera. Um, but they called up and said, would you do, would you do it one more time in 2016? Um, our speaker is, is, uh, is George Will. And of course I love George Will close to George Will. And so I said, sure, sure, I will, I will definitely do this. So a week before the dinner, they said, okay, we've uh, actually dropped George Will. We've uninvited him. And in his place, we've invited Tucker Carlson. And I, I won't say all the words that I said at the time. Um, I said, okay, are you fucking kidding me? Actually is what I said. Um, <laughs> so I show up and I say, I'll, I'll do it, but I'm not going to introduce Tucker Carlson. I'm just not going to do that in 2016 because it was very clear where he was going, going, what he was going to say. And, uh, you know, we, he came over and chatted before, uh, the, the dinner and it was, I would say it was cordial, but cool, but that was the last time that I spoke to him. And it was that weird thing that, and maybe when you, I think back on it, uh, you know, what a sort of a moment of transition for the conservative movement that they dropped George will, that George will was, uh, unceremoniously uninvited and replaced with Tucker Carlson, kind of an indication of what was happening to the conservative movement. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you another story. Um, I, when the Weekly Standard was shut down, the magazine where he yeah. kind of uh, cut his teeth, uh, they had kind of a wake party. Uh, I talked to somebody who went to it, and, and, and Carlson showed up. And I think it was all kind of very sweet and nostalgic, and I don't think there were harsh words. Obviously, he and Bill Crystal are not in good terms anymore, and he's been very uh, critical of Crystal. But I find that so poignant because, in a way, it, you know, it could have been a victory lap for him. Right. That like uh, the conservatism that he now represents has utterly vanquished in the electoral sense, the conservatism that the Weekly Standard at different points tried to uh, promote you know, national mm -hmm. greatness, conservatism and, and interventionism. And you know, I don't get any sense that, that he went there and said, ha ha suckers. No, no. As a moment, as a moment, think about it. Think about his journey and how when he arrived at that at that party, that little wake, he was the guy who who replaced those guys in the conservative movement very very much so okay just one one last point here because it's sort of you know in the last uh, couple of days as you point out in in your article though that you know he has recurring characters on his show and very much like trump who i think is quite tactical about this you know he picks who his enemies are going to be this is my foil and very frequently they turn out to be black women <laughs> like Maxine yep. Waters or Elon Omar or Kamala Harris. I mean, there's sometimes when these shots are, are justifiable, but the pattern is very, very clear. And it's kind of interesting how he's railing against the new White House press secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, who, who I have met now, I think is a lovely person, very, very smart, very, very reasonable every time that I've heard her speak. And uh, he has made a cottage industry out of demonizing her. And doesn't that strike you as very much on brand for uh, the show and the style of his show? Absolutely. I mean, I, I couldn't tell you mathematically how many times he's done that, but I will say it's a it's a leitmotif of the show that black women in positions of power are not only wrong, uh, and their ideas are not only bad, uh, but they're stupid and unqualified. Yeah. Uh, and the implication is that they're picked for their race, or in the case of Kamala Harris, they got ahead uh, because who they dated. That's something he's said a bunch of times on the show. Sometimes it's hard to know whether he thinks that Kamala Harris is, is a shadow president who's secretly pulling the strings or an incompetent uh, or both. Um, but you get both varieties on the show. And yeah, Katanji Brown Jackson, when she was nominated. I know. Uh, very uh, subtle, we, very subtle. He asked for her LSAT score. Yeah, right? Right. I talked to Fox, <laughs> I talked to folks at Fox who defended a lot of things that come in for criticism in the story that Tucker has said, but even they admit that, that one is a, it's just a clear dog whistle. Yeah. Um, and, you know, on the cover of his 2018 book, uh, Ship of Fools, you know, it's a it's a it's a classic kind of conservative imprint world book cover of a, a cartoon of a bunch of liberals and Democrats and others. And not that many, maybe like seven. And Maxine Waters is one of them. And I just always find that really striking. And I mean, no, you know, I'm not, I'm not criticizing Maxine Waters at all. She's a senior congresswoman. She's a, a committee chair. You know, 
I don't think anybody, if, if, if you watch TV, she's not on TV an awful lot, right? Right. Um, she's not the voice of the Democrats uh, on a lot of things on policy. She's a, a senior member of Congress from the Democratic Party. Um, it's notable that she ends up in the pantheon of six or seven people oh, on yeah. Carlson's book cover. I don't think it's an accident. Okay, so I just called up the book cover, and this sort of like wraps everything up. So, so there's, there's, you know, the Tucker Carlson ship of fools, how a selfish ruling class is bringing America to the brink of revolution. And there is Maxine Waters shouting, and there's Nancy Pelosi, there's Hillary Clinton, uh, there is uh, Zuckerberg, I think that's uh, Jeff Bezos. And um, as the boat goes over the waterfall, the ship of fools is about to go over the waterfall, the person at the very front of the ship with the spyglass is Bill Crystal former editor of the Weekly Standard, who, <laughs> who right. probably commissioned many pieces by Tucker Carlson and at whose wake he showed up. But so when did that book come out? Oh, that was 2018, fall 2018. So apparently he got over his his, his grief about the Weekly Standard pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Nick Confessori, thank you so much for joining me. If you have not read this uh, three-part series, it is incredibly well done uh, in its detail, but the way in which uh, you and your colleagues really bring the receipts and for people who need to understand how this alternative reality is formed. I, I think I mentioned you before. I think that people are aware there's an alternative reality, but I don't think they understand why it is so effective and how it works. So I would strongly urge people to read this series. Nick, thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Charlie. Hey gang, I just wanted to drop in to say thank you for joining me here each weekday. And also, I want to give a shout out to our Bulwark Plus members who helped to underwrite this show and keep everything we do at the Bulwark sustainable. You might think that a Bulwark Plus membership is all about our newsletters like my daily morning shots, but really, Bulwark Plus membership is about a lot more than that. We're building a community of independent-minded, concerned patriots who value democracy and the truth. We make most of what we do free and accessible by everybody because you can't help save democracy from behind a paywall, but we do have some great member-only benefits that I'd like to share with you because in addition to our newsletters, members have commenting privileges and also have access to ad-free versions of this show and all of the podcasts in the Bulwark Network, like Sarah Longwell's Focus Group Podcast and Mona Charon's show, Beg to Differ. And there's the Thursday Night Bulwark, a live video broadcast that we host for members each week on Zoom. You can give Bulwark Plus membership a try for the next 30 days for free. Simply go to the bulwark.com slash Charlie to claim your free trial today. That's the bulwark.com slash Charlie. Thanks. The Bulwark podcast is produced by Katie Cooper with audio production by Jonathan Siri. I'm Charlie Sykes. Thank you for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. And we'll be back tomorrow to do this all over again. Just getting started with Susie Schuster has stories of humble beginnings and humbling moments from inspiring people. Angela Kinsey. Listen, I, I was on set one day on The Office and I was like, we were talking about what's your good Switch. side. And I said, there's nothing really to that, right? That's like, oh, no, there is. And our camera operator, Matt Sohn, that I had known for eight years, and I go, Matt, what's my side? He was like, this side. I was like, seriously? Oh. He goes, yeah. He goes, I always try to frame me that way. I was like, why didn't you tell me seven years ago? The new Just Getting Started with Susie Schuster. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.